Okay, so so my plan for this stream, why do I want to do this? I guess because I started this course and it was the most fun I've had programming maybe since I started programming. I've already done a bunch of the exercises in here and I figured I might as well start over and try to re-solidify what I've learned so far and like have to explain it to other people what helped me learn it. This course is it's um written by Tony Morris. Uh, I tweeted at him like to ask a question or two and he re responded. Very helpful guy. There's also a stream going through this course already by a guy named Brian McKenna. Um, the course used to be called Data 61. I think it's gone by a couple different names now. Um, but this course by Brian McKenna, I highly recommend. The reason I thought I would go ahead and do my own stream. It's just one for fun. Um, two, I'm a beginner, and Brian McKenna is like a professional. I, I think he's developed Haskell programs like professionally. I thought it might be helpful to have a beginner going through it just because of the curse of knowledge. Uh, mo mostly I wanted to do it just because I thought it'd be really fun. And I can't think of anyone that actually wants to pair program Haskell with me. So I thought maybe I would outsource that problem to the internet. Maybe with scale, I can find people that want to um, pair program Haskell with me. So Curse of Knowledge is basically the idea that once you learn something, you forget what it's like to be a beginner. So I figured, why not stream myself as a beginner? And maybe that would be helpful to people, but maybe it won't be. Um, so this is the FP course. I'm going to go ahead and open up a new tab. I have already cloned this repo I'm on this master branch of this repo. If you want to follow along, it's at github slash system system dash f slash fp course. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a scrub. I just use VS Code. No fancy terminal editors for me. Maybe someday. Just quick inter introduction to this. If you want to see the answers to the exercises, you can go to this repo, Tony Morris, the guy who's created this course as a repo where he solved all the exercises. And I'll probably be referencing that after I complete stuff. I'll probably compare my solutions to his just to see what else I can learn. Yeah, it used to be called the NICTA FP course. And I think at some point it was called the Data61 FP course. This is, a, this is an important note. So it's a linear progression uh, course. So you basically start at these very basic level things, things that are already implemented in, in the language, in the core library, um, which is called Prelude. So you're re-implementing core parts of the language so that you understand them. Um, I haven't done something like this before, but it's, it's super helpful. I've tried just diving in and learning Haskell before, just starting started to just like try to hack at it. And I just kind of failed miserably. So this course kind of finally allowed me to crack the uh, the surface and kind of learn something cool. So yeah, linear progression use the Haskell programming language to learn programming concepts pertaining to functional programming. And then it it lists like some just some basics about the course, like how it's going to work. Basically, each module has exercises and just has like a to do note that you're supposed to fill. There's some um, mailing lists and stuff you can go to to get help. Here we are, getting started. Install GHCI, which we've done. Um, some some notes about how to reload the prompt once you've changed your files and whatnot. I'll go over that. And here it's going over some basics of like the REPL, what you can use. So I'll I'll demo that really quick. So if we go into the REPL here, so if I if I this is the way I define a function and. What's so weird about it is there's no parentheses or like brackets. Um, and the way to read this, and anyone watching, please correct me, um, that basically this is, this is more akin to like a quality. Like usually in programming, this is like an assignment. So you say x equals one or x equals x plus one, which mathematically doesn't make much sense. But um that the equals the equal operator in haskell is actually equality um with some caveats i think so if i if i understand it correctly basically anywhere where you see this expression foo xy 
you can replace it with this expression, x plus y. So if I were to say foo one, two, this expression is equal, equivalent to this expression. So one is taking the place of x here, and two is taking the place of y. So basically, this is uh, like a pattern matching um, operation. So we're going to pattern match x to 1 and y to 2. And we're going to replace this expression with x plus y, where x is 1 and y is 2. And that's pretty weird. Um, but we'll get into that more later. Um, so there's a few helpful commands in the REPL that the, the readme is going over. Basically, there's this info command and type. That's kind of the, the main thing. So I can say info foo. And it tells me some information about this function foo that I've defined. Basically, it's, it's telling me where it's defined, which it's defined in a REPL. And it's uh, telling me the type information, the function signature. So this is this is going to be pretty weird to any um, Haskell be beginners out there, but basically it's saying foo is a function that takes an a and takes another a and returns an a where a is some number. Um, so this is like a type constraint. So may maybe it'd be easier if I explain. Yeah, here we go. So I can actually I can actually set my own type signature by doing this the following expression. So just to explain a little bit, this bracket command is basically saying I'm about to define a multi-lined function. GHCI just wants to interact on a single command basis, so you have to say it like, hey, I'm about to do a multi-line thing here. Um, so the way to read this line is who has the type of, so this double colons here you can read, has the type of int to int to int. So basically, I take an integer as input, and then another integer as input, and then I return an integer. So I've just defined what the type signature of this function is. And so now I'm going to define the actual function. So I'll say foo x y equals x plus y. So x in this case matches to this integer y matches to this integer and then the resulting expression should also be an integer so i'm going to end the multi-line expression here with a closing bracket so now if i do this info thing again i could say info foo and you'll see foo has the type int to int to int Let's just test this out. Two plus four is six. So um, info gives basically the type signature and also where it was defined. I think type is a little bit more um, succinct. Yeah, it just tells you the function signature. I, I think that the difference between these two commands, type and info, um, there's some more differences for more um, complicated functions, especially because I'm just defining it here in the REPL. So you're not seeing anything that that helpful. Um, so so that's where we are in this readme. It's just going over some of the basic commands, the REPL commands, and also how to run the tests for these exercises. Um, so let's just go ahead and dive into some of the exercises. Don't want to bore people too much reading through this readme when you can do that on your own time. Um, recommend you perform some exercises before the others. The first is exactly one. So that's what we're, we'll do. We'll open up the exactly one module. Um, OK. Might have to figure out GHCI here for in a sec, but um, Basically, this Haskell project, which I cloned from the FP course, um, has this structure where there's a source. There's source is basically what you care about. This is kind of extra stuff. Um, it has two directories, the test and the actual uh, code. So um, 
right, README recommends starting at exactly one. So, and it's saying I don't have GHCI installed. I think that's because um, the course is just set up to, it just wants a GHCI on your path as an executable. And I don't have GHCI on my path, I have stack. So I think I have to go to support here. And there's some stuff here to help you if you're using stack. So let's see, copy tool files.sh. I'm just going to run this. Source. Oh, wait, it was support. Copy tool files.sh. I'm going to move those some of these files over. I don't think I actually need all these files, but if I reload my editor. Start Visual Studio Code. Thanks. Okay, cool. So that worked. I, I think I'll maybe later I'll go and clean up some of this. I think probably well. I don't, I definitely am not using Nix, so I'm going to remove that. Um, Cabal is like a package manager. I, I don't really understand the ins and outs of package management in Haskell, so um, I'm just going to leave that for now. Uh, the, the other thing I should note as far as um, setup, I wanted to get like into the exercises faster. Um, but this, I guess I need to cover this stuff in case people want to follow along. So um, something really helpful for setup is if, if you're using VS Code, extensions, show installed extensions. I have a couple of extensions in VS Code that have helped me a ton. So the first is Haskell, obviously, um, which I think depends on this Haskell syntax highlighting. And it basically runs this Haskell language server, which gives you all kinds of like auto completion stuff. And um, like you can evaluate certain code in your editor, which is pretty nifty. Um, and the other thing is this Haskell linter. As a, as a Haskell noob, not really knowing what is good practice, this thing is pretty amazing because it will basically just have quick fixes that it recommends. And I just basically followed those and I feel like I've learned some best practices and like how to do um, some simple refactorings. And um, it also, the, the refactorings it recommends is pretty powerful. So uh, if you're doing this setup, I highly recommend doing um, this just basic Haskell extension and Haskell linter. Okay. Cool. So I think we're basically ready to dive in. So let's see. Course exactly one. Um I'm not really sure how uh how in depth I want to go here, especially as a beginner myself. I don't want to like sit here and explain um incorrectly explain things, but I'll just explain it from my point of view. And if anyone out there um, knows better than me, please, please interrupt me and correct me. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to explain in my own mind what these things, uh, what I think these things are. <laughs> and we'll see how it goes. So these special comments here are called language pragmas, and they basically just set certain rules for the compiler to follow. Um, I'm not really going to go into what these mean because I, I probably don't fully understand the implications myself. Um, this this statement, mo module course exactly one, is defining the module of this, this file. So it's saying this module is called course dot exactly one, and then saying where all of these things exist basically where run exactly one is equal to this expression and where map exactly one is this expression etc um, these lines are importing other libraries which as you as you go through the course it um, 
will learn what these things are, which is what what makes this course pretty awesome. It's just uh, the linear progressive nature of it, where basically starting at scratch and re-implementing like core parts of the language. Um, cool. So line eleven is kind of the the first line that's like actual code that we care about. Um, so line eleven is saying. Ignore the, the lint suggestion here for a second. So data is a keyword in Haskell that's basically saying you're introducing a new data type. Um, so you're saying, I'm introducing a new data type called exactly one. And exactly one takes a single parameter. And already that's pretty weird because you're thinking like a type takes a parameter. Um, and it's like the first course, like someone coming from dynamic languages like Ruby and JavaScript. This took quite a bit of um, quite a bit of reading and just hacking to understand how this works. Um, but basically, it's saying exactly one is a data type that takes some parameter, and the way you construct an exactly one is by using this expression. Um, so that's a pattern that's like common in Haskell to name the constructor the same thing as the data type itself. Um, again, welcome to any new newcomers. I'm a Haskell noob going through this course, just trying to explain it out loud so that I can uh, learn it myself. Um, so let me let me run this in the REPL and see, see what we get. Yeah, I wonder if this is going to be font is going to be overbearingly large. Please tell me if it's too large or too small. I want to make it large enough. Um, cool. Cool. So I think what I need to do is say load source course exactly one. Yes. Oh yeah, that's the other thing I forgot to mention is when you install the Haskell extension and the Haskell linter, you get this auto formatting, which is really handy as someone new to Haskell. Okay, so I've loaded um, source course exactly one, this module into my REPL. So I should now have access to this exactly one data type. And I can inspect that by using the info command we talked about a second ago. Info. Exactly one. So it's telling me everything it knows about its exactly one data type. Um, and it's, it's basically showing the different interfaces, or the way I think about it is the interfaces that it implements. Um, so let's try to construct an exactly one. So the, the way we construct an exactly one is to use this keyword, exactly one. So I'm going to give it a string, hello. And this is not very exciting, is it? Exactly one hello resolves or um, evaluates to exactly one hello. So maybe let's store that. A variable x. Then now I can um, interrogate what what is what is the type of this uh, variable x. And it's saying x is of type exactly one. Exactly one of a where a is some string, because um, there are different types of strings in Haskell. Um, but that that's basically what this module is trying to explain to you, is this this is not a useful data type. It's just trying to explain to you how data types work. I, that's my understanding, anyways. So maybe, maybe I should explain or make a few other data types um, just to nail this point home. So maybe I will define my own data type called um, uh, rye state boolean. And I'm going to say the try state boolean is either true, which I'm going to represent with t. And oh, hey, Adam Gordon Bell, thanks for joining, man. Um, I'm going to say this tri-state boolean is either T for true, uh, F for false, 
or M or maybe. Uh, and then I can construct a tri-state Boolean with one of these constructors. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to demonstrate that the constructor doesn't have to be the same name as the data type. Um, so I can say X is, let's use Y, Y is T. So I can say, what is the type of Y? Y is a tri-state Boolean. So I, I constructed a tri-state Boolean with this constructor T. Um, Dirty Beach says, thanks, I hate it. Do you hate, what do you hate about it? Do you hate the, the syntax or? Oh, I, I just realized that my camera is like in the way of the code. Sorry about that. So my tri-state Boolean isn't exactly a, use, a very useful type either. Um, but we'll get there. Just the concept of a tri-state bool, yeah. Yeah, not a very useful type. Um, I had to I have to be, bring some nonsense to Haskell. It's so it's so rigorous. Um, okay. So what this module does is it it defines some helper functions for us. So the the actual well actually this this course doesn't actually have any exercises for us. I think it's just trying to say like here's some basic Haskell syntax. Um, so run exactly one is a function that you can read this double colon as has the type of. So run exactly one has the type of uh, exactly one to A. So it takes an exactly one of A and returns an A. So see type reload and say, first I'll make an exactly one. Exactly one. Um, Adam Gordon Bell, capital O. And then if I, so if I, if I inquire, what is this type? X is an exactly one, A. If I say run exactly one, X, that will return the string, Adam Gordon Bell. So it, this run exactly one is basically just unpacking this data type and getting to the parameter that you, you put in in there. Trilean, yeah. Tri state Boolean. Um, map exactly one takes a function from A to B, takes an exactly one A, and returns an exactly one B. Um, and this is one of the things like first learning Pascal was like the syntax is so weird. Like especially the Having the fun function application just be a space was like so trippy to me, but then after a while, it's just like your brain adjusts to it somehow, and then it just feels awesome. Um, and if you don't believe me, then just stick with it. Um, okay, so let's let's take a look at this map exactly one. So say um, x is pineapple, map exactly one. So what do we want to do with this string? I need a function from A to B. So in this case, I'm going to say, I want to take a string and uh, do something with a string. So what's something we can do with this string? I think, do I have uppercase in this? Probably not because they did this language, pragma, no implicit dude. Maybe I'll just use an integer instead. Exactly one. Um, 9,000. Um, so now I can pass in a function that manipulates an integer somehow. Oh yeah, I could reverse the string. Do I have reverse? I think like the course is linear progression. So it's like, I literally don't have anything. Yeah, I don't even have reverse. Oh, P reverse from prelude. I'm just gonna stick with the integer for now. So I have X exactly one and um, I'm just going to multiply it by two. So that's a function um, from A to B. The other, the other thing to keep in mind is, um, and the other thing to keep in mind is this A to B, it doesn't necessarily have to change the type. It's just saying you, you can have a function that just changes the type. So in other words, if I was to say A to A, 
would have to remain the same type, but by saying A to B, it can still stay like an A, it can still say an integer. Um, so the function doesn't have to basically transform the type, but it can, is what it's saying. So um, map exactly one. So the first argument to map exactly one is a function from A to B. Um, so we're already going into higher order functions here. And I can define this function by saying uh, multiply times two. And I'm going to wrap it in prints here. And then I'm going to pass it. The next, arg the next uh, argument to the function, or to map exactly one, is an exactly one. And I have one called x. And then if I evaluate this, it, it resolves to an exactly one. So um, takes this A, basically unpacks this type, drills down to um, get to this value, and then applies this function to it. Um, this, this kind of syntax will, will in, in, the, in the next courses, we'll, like, we'll have to do this kind of pattern matching, unpacking these data types a lot. Um, so it'll become more clear like what exactly is happening there. Um, Okay, next one, bind exactly one. So this one takes a function as well, but it takes a function from A to an exactly one B. And again, anyone, if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions, um, I, it's quite likely that people watching this have much more experience with Haskell than me. Um, so this bind exactly one takes a function from some value to an exactly one B. So I think I only know one way to do that, which is to construct it. So if I define a function foo that takes an X and basically wraps it in this data type. So I'm going to create an exactly one of X. The binding shadows X. Oh, that's all right. The foo takes an A and returns an exactly one of A. Um, then let's see. I'm going to say Y is an exactly one of three. So now I can call bind exactly one. Oops. Find exactly one, I'll pass it my foo function, which just basically wraps it in exactly one. Then I'll pass it my exactly one, I think I called y. And it should basically, if we look at the implementation here, it, it takes this exactly one, it basically gains access to this variable inside this exactly one a, and then applies the function f to it if that works. Okay. So it returns exactly one, one, two, three. It's not very, not very exciting function there. Um, so, but that, that's basically, I think this module is just trying to give you a rundown of the basic syntax. Um, cool. So let's see the readme. Okay, here to go to next. Okay, the next next module it recommends is validation. I'm just gonna check some. Um, preview this. Uh, okay, so next it recommends this validation module. Do we get into some actual exercises here? Uh, no, I think this is also just like example code to kind of give you an introduction into Haskell. Um, so I can go over this quickly. Um, so again, we have a new data type. 
called validation that that is parameterized by some input a um, and the way to construct an instance of this validation data i don't know if instance is the right word the way to construct a validation type is with either of these two constructors so either error um, or value and you'll see that error takes an argument of type error of type er which is looks like to just be an alias of string um or so, or you give it a value of some some type a which can be any type um, maybe I, maybe i should mention too that um capitalization is important in um in haskell i'm just thinking like i don't i don't want to give like a full rundown of like haskell because i think there's some stuff out there like learn x and y um, probably goes over the basic syntax i, I want to try to get to the exercises and then if people have like questions about syntax um i can go to it there but i think it's kind of boring just listening to me talk i'd rather be like solving problems okay um, so what I was saying basically is capital expressions or, or terms that begin with a capital letter are like formal types. So this is saying error is a constructor that takes some type of type error, whereas a, because it's lowercase, is, a, is actually a type parameter. So it, it can be any type. So if, if basically if this was lowercase error, it would base it would still be a parameter. Like this could instead of error, it could be taco. Um, but by by capitalizing it, you see it, the syntax highlighting turns it purple there, and it's expecting like I'm expecting some type taco. Um, so I'll change it back to error. So let's make it. Let's make a. Uh, Let's make a validation value. I'm going to load in source course validation. Let's say now I should have access. I'll do info validation. OK, get some inf information about it there. So I'll say x equals value of Haskell. And then I'll inquire what the type of X is. And it says it is a validation. So this is kind of like um, basically build your own, like either, if you're familiar with either or like option. Um, it's a way to make like an, an either type. So you can say like the left hand value is some error. So you can imagine like making a function um, like a network request or or dividing. And if, if you divide by zero, you return error of some string, which is like you can't divide by zero. Or if the division is successful, then you would say like value some in it. Um, so let's see. Okay, here here we'll talk a little bit about pattern matching. So this function is error takes a val uh, of a value, an argument of type validation. Um, validation of a or I don't know if that's the right way to say it, a of validation. A type validation a and returns a bool. And you'll see it's defined twice here. This is like um function overloading so if you if you're familiar with uh, like elixir um not sure what other languages allow for like overloading like this but basically when you call this function it's going to try to pattern match on every expression of is error so from from top to bottom so the first one it'll try sorry about this like highlighting um, Kind of annoying. 
so the first one it's going to try is this top one. So it's going to take this value, validation A, and try to pattern match it. So if the validation A was constructed with this error keyword, then it will return true. If this value is not an error, but it's actually value, it was constructed with this value constructor, then this pattern match will fail and it will just keep looking and it will go to this next definition of is error. Um, it will pattern match with value. And this underscore is basically saying, we don't care about the value, uh, the, the actual value that's wrapped inside validation, just throw it away and return false. Um, so I have this type X here, which was constructed with this value keyword and the string Haskell. We'll say is error x and see it returns false. So let's do y equals error um, port. So I say is error y return true. But I think that this this simple function is trying to demonstrate how pattern matching works. Um, I, I can maybe do an even simpler expression um, or an even simpler function. So I'll def define it in here. So I'll just define the function is one, it's takes an integer and returns equal. And I'll say if you pass literally this value, a value of one, to the function, I'll return true. And then if you pass any other value, any other integer to the function, I'll return false. So this is like um, the simplest version of, of this I can think of. And it's complaining at me because it's saying you defined some variable x, but you're not using it, which is why they've done this underscore here. Um, so maybe the, the more appropriate thing to do would just put an underscore here saying basically it doesn't matter what this value is, just return false. So I'm just doing R for reload there. And I could say is one 300, that returns false. Is one one, it's true. That's basically pattern matching. Um, Okay, and then this function is the first time we're seeing this dot operator, which is pretty mind blowing if you're not used to Haskell. So if I look at um, this dot operator, if I say info, I'm gonna have to wrap it in uh, parentheses like this. So. This dot it is actually uh, a function, which is kind of weird to think about. So this is an operator, and this is its function signature. <laughs> so dot takes a function from B to C, and a function from A to B, and then it takes an A, and it returns a C, which don't don't worry if that doesn't if uh, you don't grasp that yet. Um, it, it's maybe clear to just see it used and use it yourself. Um, so maybe the easier way to think about it is just its function composition. So if you're used to a language like F sharp or Elixir, there's this operator, which is like the pipe operator, or simply in Bash. Um, you know, if you've ever done like a pipe, a grip. So it, it's kind of like pipe. Um, maybe that's a horrible uh, comparison. Maybe like true Hasklers would uh, probably foul at that. But the, the other thing to know is it's kind of like a pipe, but in the opposite direction. So um, this is error function we defined takes takes a value of um, validation of type validation 
and returns a boolean. What this is error thing does. And not is a function that takes a boolean and returns a boolean, which we can confirm by saying type of not bool to bool. So if we say not true is false, not false is true. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna first like rewrite this a little bit to say is value takes some argument x. Um, then we will will basically apply the function is error to x, and then negate this. So we'll we'll, we'll check if x is is an error and then negate that. So let's see. X is value two. Is a is first. Let's check if it's an error. Error x is false. I'll do is value x. So let's think about this. X is value foo. It's going to check if it's an error, which should be false. It's going to negate that boolean to be true. So I expect this to be true. Yes. Okay. So. Why did I rewrite this? Well, because is error is a function that takes an x and not is from an from some validation to a bool, and not is a function that takes a bool. We can basically chain these two functions together. So I can say. I can basically say the linting is going to yell at me here, but I can use this dot operator, period operator, and say compose not with is error. So basically saying um, run not. So so another way to think of it is like um, I should just do a comment here. F. This is the classic way you see it explained in like books or uh, like blog posts or whatever. See, um, and you read this as like G, G after X is the same as F applied to G. So you should, no wait, I did that backwards. If I say, G after F applied to X is the same as basically F applied to X and then G applied to the result of F after X, or G applied to the result of F applied to X. Um, so it's just a way to like unwrap all of these parentheses. So um, let's let's check to make sure I'm telling the truth. Reload, and I'll say I have foo. I call that x equals value foo. I'll say is value. Let's say let's say mean something else. I'll say um, name is equal to value, and I'll say is value name is true. So that those are equivalent expressions. And what the linter is yelling at me now is saying suggestion at a reduce replace with is value not posed with there. So explain that in a second, but let's just like take it at its word and say like let's just replace this. And then it's telling me redundant brackets. So we don't actually need these brackets. So reload, try this again. So it still works. So why does this still work? So it's saying is value is the same as the function is value is the same as composing these two functions together. Um, maybe it's better explained like this. So. 
you say add Int to int, add x, y equals x, y. Okay, reload. So if I look at the type of add, it's int to int to int. So you, you can think of this as comment here. You can kind of think of it as as this, like add is a function that takes two integers and returns an int. So like that's how you would do it in in JavaScript, right? You would say like um, function add x y return x plus y. Um, but in Haskell, you'll see there's like no um, parentheses around this expression. So you you can just as um, it's all it's also valid to think of it like this. So add is a function that takes an integer and returns a function, and it turns a function that has a signature int the int. So that would be like the JavaScript equivalent of saying like add takes an x, a single argument, and returns a function that takes an argument if I can type. And then that function returns x plus y. Um, so you can think of this as currying if you're not familiar with currying. Um, definitely something to look up. Basically, a way of taking a function that takes multiple parameters and turning that into multiple functions that each take one parameter. Um, so like you'll even see this kind of notation here. And if I was to do this in JavaScript, say function add, whoops, add x return function y returns x plus y. So I could say uh, result is add one, two, result is three. But I can also say, say I defined function like add three, and I just apply a single argument to this function. If I just apply a single argument to this function, I return this one. So I could I could just say this, and now if I look at the type of add three, the function, the function where x is like a closure. So, so now this this x has this this function returned here is closed around this x, which is defined as three. So I can say add three. Apply that to four and get seven. So, um, so hopefully for the JavaScript folks out there, that's helpful. Um, but we're returning back to Haskell for a second. Um, I could do the same thing. So I could say add three is equal to add space three. So I'm just supplying this first argument, and then I can check the type of add three. You'll see it's it's like I've given it the first integer and it's returned this function. Where it's like the um what's the term for it? Uh like deferred 
deferred evaluation or partial application, another way to put it. So this three is just like hanging out there. The X is already defined as three and we're just waiting on the Y now. So that's what add three is. So add three, seven. Um, the, the key difference here in Haskell, the example in, in JavaScript, is that the syntax, you don't have to change the syntax. It's, it's um, this is just automatically curried. Everything is automatically curried. There is a way to specify, I think, uncurry. So you can say, like, I actually don't want this to be curried. So I can say, uncurry, add, and I could call this new add. And then I could check the type of that. And now it, now it specifically says, you must give me two integers. You can't just like give me one or it blows up. It's like, you're supposed to give me two arguments. Okay, I think I've beaten that horse to death. Um, next next uh, function here, the validation module, map validation. So this is basically, um, the same is that exactly one example. So let's see map validation here. Map exactly one. Very similar. So it takes a function from A to B, and then it takes some type of some value of type validation returns a new validation. Same as exactly one, where it's taking function A to B, um, exactly one A, and returns exactly one B. But in this case, there was only, in the case of exactly one, there was only one way to construct an exactly one. Whereas with validation, um, there's two different constructors, the error constructor and the value constructor. That means, there has to be two different ways to, we basically need to pattern match on this and figure out which one it is. So it's either an error, um, in which case you see we ignore the function. Um, big. This previewing thing, maybe I can turn Git lens off. Getting annoyed by. Buckle. I'll just say. Um, lens. Save. Sorry, that was just really bothering me. Okay. I think that's better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so in this, this map validation, you'll see it's ignoring the first argument with this underscore here and basically saying if, if the, the validation validation a is like an error just ignore the function and just return the error as is because there's nothing to do with the function um it's an error we don't want to operate on it but if it pattern matches against this value constructor unpack this a um, and apply the function to it and then wrap it up in value again so what I mean by unpack and wrap up is, how do I explain this? Um, let's 
like if I have an exactly one of test. Oh, I, I've loaded this other module, so let me do a validation. Validation a value value of test. Then I could say y equals x, and then y is just also a validation a. But I, I could also pattern match and say value z is equal to x. So remember that the, this uh, equal sign is um, substitutional equality. I don't know if I just made that phrase up. But basically saying wherever you see um, this expression value z, you can replace that with x. I don't know if the vice versa is true. I think there's some like left hand, right hand side differences. Um, but if x is a validation of type A, which was constructed with this value thing, then then by doing this pattern matching, we can we can get at whatever value was inside this validation type by by pattern matching against it like this. So then if we look at Z, it's just the string test. Whereas when we said y equals x and check the type, it's still of type validation A, where A is some string. But if we pattern match like this, then now I can I can say, uh, what is Z? Well, Z is this string test. Um, but if I was to try to pattern match error um, A, what's our error? some x. If I try to p pattern match this, it's going to fail because x wasn't constructed with the error constructor. It was constructed with this value constructor. Um, so if I look at, or did that actually work? Yeah. So if I try to inspect this sum x variable, I get this exception, non-exhaustive non pattern matching. Um, Yeah, non-exhaustive patterns. Because um, it's, it's complaining that you didn't pattern match against everything that X could have been. So that's what that's kind of what's going on here. Bind validation is kind of the same thing with bind exactly one. So we took a function from A to exactly one B and exactly one A return basically unwrap this one get this a out of it and then um, run this function f so you can kind of see how these line up so um, we take this value we get the a out of it and this is just kind of like pseudocode and then we have this function Um, we unwrap this value, get the a out of it, and then apply this function to it. We'll get this exactly one b out, and we can re basically return that exactly one b. Um, I don't know if that was a very helpful way to explain it, but um, your pattern matching here, just like we did with the um, value triple. So now we have access to this a variable, and then we can apply the f function to it. Um, so it's the same story over here in validation, this over here. Same kind of thing here, but we have to pattern match because validation can be constructed two different ways. Um, it, it's also looks very similar to this map validation. The only difference being map validation, we wrap it back up. It's ba basically we deconstruct the validation type, get access to this a variable, apply this function f to the to this a variable, and then reconstruct with using this value constructor. Um, whereas in bind validation, this f already wraps it. 
and validation. Um, so basically, if we put a value here, the result of this um, function would be a validation of validation b. It would be like double wrapped um, since this, this f function already wraps it. Well, let's see if I can uh, if I can demonstrate this. Find validation. So let's define some function that takes an A and returns a validation. Um, Maybe I would say um, yeah maybe, maybe i'll I'll define a function here and say uh, is is true I'll say. is true if I'll just pattern match if it's true then say valid. this is kind of very but if is true applied to anything else I'll wrap it in an error say not true Oh, I should find this one. Do it this way. So is true is a function that takes a bool and returns a validation. And I, the reason that didn't work is the constructor is value, not valid. Match type A with boo. Doing wrong. A. Oh, I think I have to. I think it has to be string because this one is a string so is that why hmm. can match type a with char char Maybe I need to say, we should just do this. OK, yeah, I think that works. Because the constructor, the value needs to be a type A, but error is just like always a string. So my function here is true, like takes a boolean. If it is true, we return the value true. If it's not true, then we return this error. And actually, we don't care what this value is, so we can just put an underscore. So now if I reload, so now I have a function it goes from A to validation E. Like this matches that pattern. 
and I just need a validation A. So I'm going to say x is value false. And now I can say bind validation. Give it my function is true. Then I can give it my value x I just defined. So it's going to take uh, is true here. Then it's going to take x, which is value false. It's going to pattern match. It's going to say, is the validation a you passed in an error? Shouldn't be. It was constructed with value. So it's the pattern matching is going to fail here. It's going to keep going. It's going to say, is it a value? Yes, it is. A is been assigned to this value false. And this function f is applied to A. So A is false. So then we drop down here. The is true. This expression doesn't pattern match because A here is false. So it's going to drop here and should return this. It doesn't care about the value, so it should just return error not true. Ah, yep. And it's a lot more tedious when you're trying to explain everything. <laughs> Mouthful. OK. Value or. More pattern matching here. Basically saying, if it's an error, you basically supply it with a validation value of uh, an argument of type validation and some other argument that's the same type as the value inside this validation type. And if it's an error, you return the second argument. And if it's a value, you just return the value unwrapped. So, so for example, I could say value or and I could give it a value hello world. Um, so it's not an error, the value, so it's going to return a here. So in this situation, hello is the string. That returns hello. But if I were to say the argument is a validation argument, I Reply, um, apply is is an error. It's going to pattern match here and say, okay, this is an error. So re return the second argument, world. And you can see how something like this would be useful if you were um, kind of almost think of it as like ternary in JavaScript. So like. You know, if foo is, is true, then return foo. Otherwise, you no, know, turn. You no, know, whatever. Um, maybe that's a bad example, but because foo is not like a wrapper around some value, it's just a straight value. But um, turns validation. Error or this one takes argument of type validation A and an error. Returns the validation's error side or the given default if it is a value. So it's basically the opposite of value or. So it's saying, if it's, this one's saying, like, if it's a value, return that value. This one's saying, if it's an error, return that error. Otherwise, um, default. So going back here, say, error or, in this case, this doesn't pattern match, it drops down here, so it should return world. In this case, return hello. Okay. Value validation. So this 
is kind of funny. It's just saying like you can define some function that takes some value and constructs it into a validation type. So this function is literally equivalent to this constructor. So value validation one two three. Oh, it's spelled it wrong. That's just the same as constructing it. But this kind of pattern will be more um, useful for more complicated types that are like harder to construct. Right. OK, so I think we've finished all the introductory kind of stuff just to get you over the basic syntax and the basic um, it's like the basic run of the mill, like defining functions and calling them, which I know that probably was kind of fast if you're not um, familiar with Haskell. But my, my hope is that this is something that people could watch and um, get unstuck. Uh, I'm definitely not qualified to like teach people how to uh, code in Haskell. I'm just kind of trying to sh to demonstrate, like I'm just trying to trying to explain as I'm learning, and hopefully it could um, be a resource for other people that are learning. Okay, I think what I'm going to do now is like take a quick break, grab some water, then start on this list exercise. So we'll actually start doing some exercises. List module. What I'll do now is commit what I've done so far to a branch. branch stream, which I'll push up in case people want access to stuff. Push that up. Okay, cool. I'm going to grab some water and be right back.
Who's out there? Is that uh, Dirty Beach out there? Still with me? people and then I'll start on this uh, list exercise. Cool. Ah, Dirty Beach, I'm here lurking. I appreciate it, man. So pretty silly doing. So just trying out Twitch for the first time. Cool. Okay. I think I'm going to do this list module and then call it a night. Okay. Module course list. Complete the 10 exercises below by filling out the function bodies. Replace the function bodies air to do with an appropriate solution. These exercises may be done in any order, however. Exercises are generally increasing in difficulty. So some people may find later exercises. Bonus for using provided functions or for using one exercise solution to help solve another. Approach with your best available intuition. Just dive in and do what you can. Okay. Going to load. Okay. I'm going to fold some of these lines. Sorry, I'm just getting situated here. Um, one thing I noticed about this course is they really like line wraps, and I really don't like line wraps. So I'm going to be undoing a lot of those because <laughs> it's hard for me to read. Um, let me see if I can do a. Uh, that's better. Okay. So what it's saying here, custom the custom list type. So there is a list type in Haskell already. Um, but because this is a linear progression course, we're going to implement our own list because we're just awesome like that. So the data 
the list data type parameter, parameterized by some type t construct a list by using this constructor nil which takes no arguments or you can read this pipe as or or you have some type some value of type t appended to a list of type t so that's pretty um pretty intense if you're new to haskell so it took a long time for me to wrap my head around this um so this operator is uh basically it, it's kind of like i think of it as like an infix constructor um so just like plus if i like over here and look at plus because plus is wrapped in parentheses like this, it's it's an infix operator. So you put it between its arguments. But you could also wrap it in parentheses um, and apply arguments to it this way, which is pretty weird to read. Um, so plus takes two arguments. Um, you can write it like this and put the arguments afterwards, or you can like in fixed notation like this. Um, the other thing to, to note is functions defined in prefix notation like this. So add, you would typically, um, this way, you can use them in an in infix as an infix operator like this. So you put these back ticks. And now you're basically telling the add function, take your first argument from the left and your second argument from the right. Um, which also takes some getting used to. Um, so this data type is actually defining this operator, which is called the cons operator. The reason it looks like this is because the default operator in Haskell. So if I, I'm going to open up a new tab here. Um, I'm going to just say stack GHCI. So this is just going to be a regular vanilla GHCI instead of um, a REPL in the context of this project, which has these pragmas, which say don't don't include all the default uh, Haskell stuff, which is called prelude. Um, actually, I think it might have just done that. What I need to do is go out of this directory, say stack ghci. Yeah, go. So you'll see this prelude keyword here is telling me that the pre the prelude prelude module. Um, I guess the word to use is like it's loaded or it's um it's in context or I, I forget the right way to say that, but I can. Look at this operator here, this cons operator. The cons operator takes some argument in a list and returns a list. So I could say like one cons. Oh, I'll just say an empty list. So one appended to an empty list or cons onto an empty list. This list, or I could say, um, one appended to a list with two is built in this list or this, um, et cetera. So, so all that to say, uh, the reason they're using this notation here is basically just to say this colon is like the default way in Haskell to append to construct a list. <laughs> And they're putting this dot here as just like, this is our custom cons. So you might you might see in exercises like plus dot as saying like this is our custom way of doing plus, or you might say like um, something like uh, add prime, saying we're going to define our own version of add. Um, kind of a Haskell thing I've noticed. Okay, the the next thing we need to talk about this data type. Is there's this cons thing, um, but then there's also a recursive definition. So it's t 
appended to a list, but we're defining list here. So it is a recursive definition. So basically saying this T is the head of the list or the first element of the list. And the tail of the list is some other list that you know may not be defined yet. Um, so in order to actually terminate and, and result in having like a, a value, a, a list value, you need a nil somewhere. So just like in regular Haskell, you have like one appended to an empty list. You can't just say one appended to nothing um, or just another number. It doesn't work. It has to be, there has to be some terminating value at the end. Um, so in, in our case, because we're making our own type, we're going to say the terminating value is just nil. Um, so if I, if I say x equals nil, say what type, what is x? x is a list. And you'll see it's like list of type t. Um, just like an empty list is, uh, if I say x is an empty list, and then I say what type is x, like it's a list of elements of type A, it doesn't know, right? Just like if I have you know, my list, what type is my list? It's you know a list of A's where A is some number. Um, but if I, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, an empty list, if you have a list of numbers and you take all the numbers out, it's an empty list, but it's still like a list of numbers in a way. <laughs> Um, just an empty list, so that's why nil is of type list t. We don't actually know what t. Is. Um, we can also say um, one. We're going to use our custom cons here. One appended to nil is the list one. And the reason that it's shown like this, the reason it's uh, printing to the terminal with these brackets, is because of this um, instance. So uh, maybe we don't need to concern ourselves with this yet, but we're basically saying um, list t is an instance of this show type class, and here's how to print it to the screen. So basically what it's saying is h list is this function which takes our custom list and turns it into a a regular haskell list and uh and then show show the regular haskell list so it's it's a little bit it's a little bit weird um it i think it's helpful to like this exercise is helpful to like define your own list type but then it, it kind of gets tedious later on. Like I kind of wish that it just used the um, built-in Haskell list, but I don't know. It, it is really helpful to see how it works under the hood. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. So infinity, we talked about how there's this recursive list type. So I can do one const to two const to nil, and I always have to end it in nil because because of this recursive definition. I can't just append a bunch of numbers together, um, because a list is either nil or it's something appended to a list. So the only way to construct like a terminal list that evaluates something is nil constructor. So you have to basically write it this way. Um, so the maybe kind of a corollary to that is this infinity type, which is basically saying um, let inf x equal x appended to inf x plus one. So 
this function is recurring on itself. Um, so it's taking some value x and appending it to the result of adding 1 to x and applying this function to it again. Um, so if we do this, we'll see infinity. my uh, terminal just blow up and I'm going to interrupt it. Um, and this works because Haskell is a lazily evaluated language. Um, so this, when, when you define this list, so I can say like my list, my infinite list, infinity. And that doesn't blow up my terminal because it says, okay, sure it's equal to this function, but it hasn't actually invoked this function yet. It's waiting until I actually try to use this. So one way I can try to use this safely is using this function take. Um, take basically just takes a number and then a list and then returns that, that many elements of the list. So I can say take five from my infinite list and it will return the first five values. And again, this is lazily evaluated, so it's going to say, like, take the head of this list. So then it's going to run one time, um, return zero. And it's like, okay, I need another value, keep going. And then once I've used, once I've gotten all the values I've needed, it stops evaluating. Um, pretty cool. I think languages like Swift have, uh, have infinite lists like this. Then it's going to go over fold right and fold left. Um, as just tools to use for solving of these exercises. So maybe it's best to just dig into these once we now we should probably dig into them now. And basically my explanation of this is basically I'm just stealing directly from this YouTube course. Uh I mentioned earlier in the stream uh, by Brian McKenna. Um, this is from a few years ago, so some of the ex exercises aren't exactly the same. Um, but in the in this video, he explains that you should think of fold right as constructor replacement. Um, so if I have a list one. No. Fold right is like saying take this function and some default value and then a list and return some value. So it, it might be this default value or it might be kind of the accumulation of, of calling this. So If the list you provide is nil, it just returns this uh, default value. So the way that uh, Brian McKinn explains this is basically, think of it as fold right, um, some replacement for cons, some replacement for nil, and then some list. So, so for example, I could say fold right, plus one and uh no instead of not plus uh, not plus one just plus because it takes two arguments you could say hold right plus zero and then some list so then if if some list is equal to this then fold right is is like saying um Replace cons with this plus operator and replace nil with this zero. And then this would evaluate six. So let's actually demonstrate that. So say um, old right. Well, first let me define a list. list.
and I can say full grade plus. I think I actually wanted the exercise. So spoilers. Um, yeah, yeah. And the reason why it's important to think of it as constructor replacement instead of what the name kind of implies it is, uh, is because of the lazy nature of Haskell. So you should never be able to fold right on an infinite list because the 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 name kind of um, implies that what this is doing is you have some list like this and take some operator like in this case plus and then and and some default value so it'll take zero and th this is the way I think of of fold right or like reduce from uh um, from like JavaScript or other languages like Ruby, I think of it more as the f I'm going to take uh, this operator and this starting value or some accumulator zero, and I'm going to add these first two right values together. Um, I guess we shouldn't really think of nil as the first. We should kind of think of three as the first value, um, and say. Okay, so the first iteration of the loop, we're going to say like 3 plus 0, because we're starting from the right of this list, um, full, and we're folding. So the first thing we're going to do is like 3 plus 0. And then that's our like new accumulator. Um, then we're going to take the next value and the accumulator. So we'll do 2 plus the accumulator, which is 3. We'll get five, and then we do the next value, one plus five. So like literally, maybe maybe it's easier if I do it this way. We have this list, and we have zero. And we have this operator. And this this is kind of my intuition for um, how reduce works in other in other languages. So let me see. Let me do like an example. Um, so if if I did this in JavaScript, and I did reduce and take some value and. Um, no, it, ta it takes, like, the ACK, takes the accumulator and then, like, the first value. And then, actually, let's do this, let's console log X. And then let's uh, return ACK plus X. And reduce actually takes two arguments. It takes like a reducer function and like a, a initial value, which I'm just going to throw. That's funny. It, it reduce. <laughs> this actually does start from the left. So it's saying so because we're logging each element. So we're saying like ack, which is zero. The first iteration through the loop, we're saying zero plus one. And now the new ACK is 1. And then we go back through log 1, um, 1 plus 2. Wait, did I mess that up? 0, 1. Oh, yeah, I'm not logging the ACK. I'm logging X. Yeah, it is, it is going through left to right. Um, but um, the point is, like you, you would think that fold right would would be kind of like this, but just starting from the right of the list. But you can use um, you can use fold right on infinite lists. So if if it was actually doing something like this, that would never work. But in fact, it's doing this constructor replacement. So let's demonstrate that. Um, 
I have my list still. Yeah. So I'm going to say new list equals hold right plus the starting value of zero on my list. No, say infinite or in infinity. So this is an infinite list. Um, we're going to hold it and put it in this variable. And so now we can take five values from new, or yeah, take five values from new. Couldn't match expected type of list with actual type of new. I think this has to do with um, there being like many different types of integers in Haskell. Kind of like the bane of my existence. Maybe if I say, maybe if I say this expression should be resolved to a type of like list of n. Oh no, it's not a list. It's a fold right, so it's some value. So it's yeah, my bad. So it's not actually. This should be sum, like it's basically summing an infinite list. That shouldn't work. Yeah, that's just going to lock up. Hmm. So maybe everything I just said is invalid. <laughs> yeah, how can I test this idea? Yeah, maybe you can't. Maybe you can't fold right on an infinite list. There's definitely like I, I feel like there's definitely some exercise in the future where you're like using fold right on some like lazy evaluated list, and it, like it shouldn't work if this is actually how it works under the hood. But it works like this under the hood. So, anyways, I'm gonna. Just gonna keep going. Maybe I can come back to that when I can think of a better way to explain it. Um, hold left, on the other hand, is, in my my understanding, is very much like JavaScript's reduce, where you provide a function, which you know, like this, and then you reply, or you um, Supply some like starting or some starting value, and then you supply some list, list a. Um, and if the list is nil, then you would just re return the starting value. So I mean that's kind of the same here. Like if we did list x plus x zero. Yeah, it just returns the value. So that's kind of a similar thing. But if the list isn't empty, then it kind of splits it. It does this pattern matching on the list. Say, like, give me the head and the tail, which is why it's using um, H and T here. So I can that and it's a one nil. Oh, <laughs> JavaScript. Lots of REPLs open. Okay, so H should be one, and is so you can pattern match on uh, lists like this. Which, um, might be getting my ahead of myself a little bit there. Uh, cool. So we get the function starting value, we pattern match in the list. Um, we say let b let b prime equal hard to read a function applied with b and h 
this starting value. So like if f was plus, then you're saying like this was add, then like add b to h, where h is b is the starting value you supplied and h is the head of the list. And then let b prime, so like let let the value b prime be equal to this expression in this expression. So just let in syntax is basically just a way to like break up um, lines of code. So like it would be equivalent to just replace b with with this. My understanding. Oh, but I have to do it in two places. Yeah, so that that's just like impossible to read. Uh, it's already pretty hard to read. And sec, like I've looked into, uh, the way I understand sec, which is like short for sequence, is just like escaping the lazy evaluation in Haskell to just like actually evaluate it, um, eagerly evaluate it. Um, and that might that I think that becomes relevant later, but I'm just going to continue. Um, fold left, basically, fold left is just like a for loop. Um, also, stealing that from Brian McKenna's stream going through this course. Okay. Okay, so finally, oh my gosh, our first exercise. Awesome. So returns. So we, our job is to act to um, complete this exercise. So returns the head of the list or the given default. This is very similar to our. Um, so if we go back to validation. We did this value or and this error or thing. Um, so imagine the notation will be very similar. So I'm just going to copy this over so we can see it. Um, and one very important thing that I learned from Brian McInnes' stream is you can do holes. That's cool. So a hole is basically um, a variable, I guess, that starts with an underscore. So you can do something like head or so. Like if we just do error, like it had, we say error to do, and then we load our list module, it's a compiling list, and that's fine. It works. Um, similarly, so so, but if if we try to call head or and give it some list. And we get an exception, um, exception to do. Similarly, we can do this undefined. And if we reload, compiles fine. We try to call it exception, reload undefined. Um, but if we start this variable with an underscore and we say to do this will not compile shouldn't oh, i didn't I'm still saving let's try that again ah so we get this lovely looking error message which is very intimidating um but let's just look through it so Found hole to do, which is type A, list of A to A. That's kind of the, the most important part. Um, so, so we can see what the type of this expression to do should be, um, which is pretty helpful, as we'll see. Um, just, I haven't found like the next kind of. Um, Blocks very useful, 
where a is a rigid type variable bound by the type signature where head or um i don't find that particularly to be very helpful i guess it's just how like at the very least it's giving you like some kind of stack trace like where this thing is um maybe it's misspelled um this is the other part that's helpful so relevant bindings include and or which is this type so basically it's saying you have this whole to do which has this type and here are like the things in scope so the only thing in scope for us right now is head or which is the the function we're trying to um define so we don't we we don't want to use this we don't want to like recursively call head or but then it also says valid whole fits so like here's our here's things um, th these are bindings. Th these are things like in scope. So const is in scope. Um, that appears to match this um, type definition, return, and pure. Um, so th this is how we can hold. So let me try to demonstrate. Might be helpful. Um, I'm constantly trying to like rearrange my um like have maximum uh font size but also like have it be uh cool. so for instance we could say head or it takes some argument x and it takes some list which i'm going to call X is like a common Haskell <laughs> convention from what I've seen. Um, we don't really know what these things are because it's like high parameter. Like it could be strings, could be in integers, could be whatever. So we just call them like X is of type A. X is is a list of A's. So now if we look at to do, try this again. R. I'm just going to do colon R short for reload. Okay, this is a little bit more helpful. Found hold to do. Now we see it's of type A because we filled in some of the information here. So relevant bindings include X's, which is list A, and X, which is an A. So we need to return an A. And these are the things we have in scope. So actually, we could um, valid whole fits include x. So we could just say return x here, and then this will like actually compile. It says we're not using x's. Um, so this this actually compiles. So like this this implementation of the function matches this type signature but it doesn't actually do what we want so for example um let's use some s here ed or a three um this should be one but we're getting three because we're just always returning uh this first value here we're basically we're just ignoring this list and always returning the first value um so this isn't the implementation we want um but if you remember from earlier, this example of like pattern matching, um, one nil can say this expression is equal to this one. So some some uh, value h applied to the list t is the same as this. So h is now one, and t is list two. Um, so that's a way that we can pattern match on this list. But we have to be aware that um, this list could be empty, right? So maybe we'll just try this first. We'll say add um, tail. That Non-exhaustive 
So first of all, non-exhaustive uh, pattern matches on this because we didn't uh, we didn't match on nil. that uh, full screen is showing up twitch better it's weird which doesn't like uh, capture my whole screen. Or how long it's been like that? Whoops. Okay, so um, yeah, so we don't have so we have non-exhaustive pattern match because we didn't we didn't check to see if the the list was nil. Um, we also didn't use H or T. So let's add this pattern matching in for nil. So. Um, if the list is nil, then we return x. But if the list is not nil, then we will have a head and we will have a tail. Um, and we want to return the head of the list. So like in this example, we provide three in the list. We want to provide this head of the list. An H. And then we realize we're not using X. And we're also not using not using the tail. Let's go back to this. That compiles. Let's let's test. Head or three. Aha. Okay, that works. So what happens with the list? Well, turn three. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so that's working. Um, the other thing I sh haven't covered yet is uh, testing. So this course actually provides a function test ink, not scope. So I think it, I think what I have to do is a source. Test list test, yeah. Like adding all of these tests. Now I can say test head or test test. So, um, the, the what I just did there was I used this command colon add. To basically add this um, module in the scope or in the context of my um, REPL here, and to be honest, I don't fully understand uh, the the Haskell like GHCI yet. Um, just like uh, this question mark. There's a bunch of different commands. Um, so. There's load, um, add, add modules to the current target set, load, load modules and their dependence. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really understand this notion of a target set yet. I think I'll get into later, but for now I can get it to work. So I just defer on that. Okay, so we've got this header function working. Test head or test passed. Um, I'm just going to comment out this line. Just see, see the test failing. Whoops. Okay, here we go. We see the test fail. Head or on empty list. Head or on empty list. Fails. Okay, next next exercise. Product. 
as I said, I'm going to be unwrapping mine's a lot. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard for me to read that. Um, just want to see it in a single line. Okay, the product of the elements of a list. Product of the elements of the list. So, product nil should be one. Product of non empty list, the one times two, two, two times three, six. Product of this list, where's 24? Okay. So we, we already kind of talked about this with the fold, right? I did a very similar example um, with like plus, uh, which I think is going to be some exercise, but. Um, nevertheless, let's go through this. Um, let's go through this with typed holes, so just to demonstrate. Okay, found hole to do list int. Relevant binding is a good product. So, uh, provide this uh, argument to the function x's. That will be our list. Should be we have now we have this x's in scope. Um, so. Going back to what we said here, um, we, we can think of fold right as, as Brian McKenna tells us, we can think of fold right as basically replacing this cons operator of the list with some function and replacing nil with some value. So, um, so if we want to replace one, two, three, nil uh, with plus and zero, We'll get kind of this expression. Weird at first, but after you kind of adjust to that and do it enough times, the intuition like sticks with you. Um, so the, the list that we want to apply to is x's. And because cons and nil start with um, these underscores, they're going to be typed holes. So brush here. Wish that OBS would like show my bare screen. Aha. Here we go. I hope it wasn't like that for too long. Okay. Make my camera a little smaller. Okay. I need to like blow down on down a little bit. Like hard to get this all to fit on the screen. That's not too small for people. Okay. Found whole cons. Cons should be a function. Dear to int to int to int, int. All these valid whole fits. That's kind of annoying. I I uh, did some googling, um, reading about GHCI, and figured out there's an option. Like you can parameterize your um, GHCI with this file, and GHCI options. Go for that.
A options. There's a way to like limit the number of like uh, results. How did I do that? I'm just gonna go back to my other branch where I did this. How's everybody doing out there? Wonderful. Is it Tuesday night? Okay. Max Holfitz. Studying Haskell right now, too. Let's get it. Yeah, let's do it. Haskell's super fun. This is the like the most fun I've had programming uh, in a long time. Um, I, I think because Haskell's so different, it's like it's the closest I've come to feel like to feeling like I'm learning coding for the first time again. And it's like learning how to code for the first time with the benefit of having done it once before. So it's like, Oh, I make, let me make sure to like really enjoy myself um, and appreciate what I'm learning. But this, this uh, set max val valid whole fits uh, kind of esoteric, but I found it to be helpful. I'm going to put it in my, dot uh, ghci file and then now all of the spam should go away hopefully so i'm gonna reload here yeah so it's still it's still coming up with a few of them um clear again still quite a quite a lot Oh, maybe I need to restart the back. Did I change the config? I need to start the REPL pull in the new options. Oh, and it's going to run into the type tools. Load source source. Okay. Okay, just to refresh, we're doing this list module in the FP course um, that you can find at system FP slash FP course, like this linear progression. Um, course basically starts from nothing you re-implement like core parts of the language um not because that would be a smart thing to do but because it's a helpful like thing to do to understand the language um so there's these list exercises and we solved the head or function and now we're working on product we're using bold right to do it so we're filling in the arguments to fold right with just these typed holes. So the first one, like the constructor replacement for fold right, cons, um, and nil. So, um, Pado br Pado br says it is. I've been coding for a few years, but never had a language made me hooked. The only language that I can study for hours and not get tired. Yeah, I feel the same way. I spent like hours of my free time doing this. Um, it was so fun. I was like, I want to stream myself doing this to see if I can get my friends into it. <laughs> so we'll see if that actually works or not. Okay. So cons needs to be end to end to end. We're trying to get this product. Um, so what do you say? Let's just replace this with multiplication. Um, that way we have a list. One, two, three. Apply list. So nil 
um, if we replace nil with one, that's like our starting value, then basically the way to think about this is construct a list like this, hold right does this constructor replacement and nil replacement, so to be like saying one times two times, I want to replace nil with this value one. Um, so this, I think, will get us what we need. Save that. Refresh, reload the module. Compiles, Let's try it. Product nil, v1 is product of six is cool so let's see what hlint is hlint suggestion at a reduce replace with product fold right times one so at a reduction is this idea that um this is this will result in a value um an integer so it's basically saying like this integer is the same as this integer, or sorry, this integer is the same as this integer. Um, but since since x is is like the same on both sides, we can just reduce those. Say this function is the same as this function. So it's it's similar to um, like if you had like x plus z equals y plus z. You can subtract the z from both sides. Get x equals y. The same kind of reasoning. Um, that's what edit reduction is. Um, kind of like weird to wrap your brain around at first. Let's just let's uh, reload the module again. We can test it by saying product test product no i think because i restarted my REPL, i need to add the test module back yeah clear that test product is the is the like how's the this is my literally my first time streaming how's like the audio and the lag and the font size and everything let me know if it's what is annoying or would be what what could be better okay some is going to be very similar so we have some list x's we want to fold right same thing say cons nil and we already know that we're going to be able to edit reduce this. um Just gonna go ahead and remove the X's. Okay, good. I'm glad the stream is okay so far. Let's refresh. We want some cons should be replaced with a function int to int to int. And nil should be replaced with an int. So we're summing stuff. Um makes a lot of sense to use plus. So let's uh, example again. So if we want to replace the constructors of this with plus, we want to replace nil. We can't replace it with one like we did with um, product. Because a number times one is itself, but a number times zero is zero, so that doesn't work here. Um, but with some, we want Want a starting value of zero to accumulate from. So let's try that. So plus Okay. 
So, uh, Pado, what's uh, your studying Haskell? What what all have you done so far? Are you like doing any courses or books? Some let's try test. Okay, that's pass. Thanks. going to use type holes that's one of the other thing i like love about haskell is like these type holes seem really weird at first but then i found it's like such a fast feedback loop that just keeps me focused forever <laughs> it's like i can focus it's just like a little note it's like here's what you need to do next um so i need i need to return an integer and i have a list so anytime we're going from a list to a value, a list of values to a single value that's like a hint you can like hold right. Um, there. Um, just kind of like um, the way I think about it, like it's from my. JavaScript in Ruby days is like um, if you want to go from a list, I should say array, to, to the array of the same size, um, then you should use map and go from array, smaller array, filter. Use is it go from array value. So when we see like a list of values to a single value, we should be thinking use. Okay, hold right. Pado says started learning FP with TypeScript. There's not a lot of material. TypeScript and FP. Every tutorial had this Haskell type signatures. I've noticed that as well. Couldn't understand. Decided to study Haskell. I'm using the Haskell from first print book. That's awesome. Um, what I've done, um, I've I've gone through most of this course, so I highly recommend it. So let's go to the readme. Streaming from a potato right now. This computer is super old, but it's what I have to stream with. So, um, so this course has these modules. So, early in the stream, I went through these two modules, which don't have any exercises. They're just going through um, basic the basic like Haskell syntax, like data constructors, pattern matching, um, and like composition. And oh, did we skip optional? I guess I skipped right over optional. Okay, recommend you start here. They do not contain exercises, just to provide a cursory examination. Next step is to complete <laughs> optional. So I skipped right over optional and went to list. Um, that's okay. It says earlier that you can um, do them. You don't have to do them in order. This is just the most natural order. Grab the link best. Excellent here. And um there's also a link um, to Tony Morris's fork of this, uh, where he has like solutions to all the exercises. Bump the font up a little bit. Um, anyways, the re the reason I open this file is to say, um, 
you start basically implementing your own optional type list and then it's a pretty big jump from there functor applicative monad state um etc and i got all the way up and completed the json parser which just blew my mind that like i'm doing this beginner course on haskell and i like built a json parser <laughs> like i the idea of of building a json parser from scratch and like ruby or javascript is sounds very intimidating to me but somehow um and like a haskell course can get you there i mean to be fair i started this like in the holidays in the, like november so and just in my free time so it took me maybe like 20 hours um to get to json parser but it was so fun i thought i should probably stream myself doing this um and just record it in case it's helpful to anyone out there the other thing i should mention is um there's uh this video series by brian mckenna i'll paste it in there too. i watched a lot of this like when i got stuck i watched this um stream of him going through the exercises how do i get my chat here Twitch streamer. Um, and that was super helpful, but that it's kind of an old video, so the exercises have changed, and so not everything was the same. And also, I think he goes pretty fast um, because he's pro Haskler, so I thought maybe it'd be helpful for me to stream just because I'm a beginner and I'm going to run into the same problems beginners would run into. Wow, this is taking forever. Is that even it? FP course. Pull this up. Brian McKenna. There we go, finally. Cool. Yeah, so that's what I've done. I've also gone through a little bit of um, this uh, Learn You a Haskell book, which was also really helpful. Um, the free book online. It's it's just it starts from like absolute basics. Great. Um it's pretty pretty like friendly read. Um that and then what the last thing I've done is uh that was also super helpful. This guy, Soding. He's got this series called uh Haskell rank. That actually might it might be the thing that got me hooked. Um, Haskell rank solving ha hacker rank problems. Haskell, because it's just like not a lot of um, not a lot of fluff. Like not a like like here's how the syntax works. It's just like here's this problem. Like let me solve it for you really fast. And uh, get that link. Sorry, I'm kind of like hopping between computers. There we go. Let's roll it. Um, yeah, this this course is like the thing that I've spent most of my time on. Yeah, let me finish the rest of this list module, and I think I'm going to call it a night. And if anyone has any questions, like, please throw them out, or suggestions, like, 
probably a lot of people um, that would see this and just like know a lot more about uh, about it than me. So, um, hello, Pluminator. Good to have you. Okay, so we're doing this list um, function. So we just take a list and return the, the link. So, um, but because we're doing this linear progression thing, um, you're welcome, Pado or Pado. Um, uh, because we're doing this linear year progression exercise, like we have like so few tools at our disposal. <laughs> um, so we don't have a length function yet. Um, basically, the only thing we have is like a list type, fold right, fold left, and this header function we made. Um, but like I was saying here, uh, if we want to go from an array to this a similar like the same size array, we use map. Um, if you want to go from array to a smaller array, use filter. If you want to go from array to a value, you immediately should be like thinking about reduce or hold right. So um, reduce like in JavaScript or uh, Ruby and Haskell. Um, live in the ivory tower, so we hold right. So we're going from a list to a value, so I'm going to do fold right. I'm just going to fill in the arguments to fold right. So reload this. And fold, and these holes, but because they start with underscores, they're going to tell us um, what they should be. So found hole cons. Cons should be a function a to int to int. And nil should be an integer. So, um, and because there's some some new folks in the stream, I'm just gonna go back over this like idea of constructor replacement. Um, so the way to think about fold right is we have some list, um, like one two three, like this one two three nil, and Fold right takes these two arguments and then a list. The first argument is the thing you want to replace this cons operator with. And nil is the thing you want to replace nil with. So we don't really want to do anything with these values. So we don't really care about them. We just want the length of the list. So my instinct is just like, let's just replace nil with zero. Because our, our uh, com compiler is telling us um, this nil should be an integer. So I'm going to replace that with zero. What should we replace cons with? Any ideas? So con should take an A. So that one of the cool things about this like whole driven development or type driven develop, development is we can see cons the func should be a function that takes an A and an int and returns an int. So we can just like fill that in. We can just say take an A or take some value X and We'll just do a new hole. So to do here should be um, a function from integer to integer. And the bindings we have in scope are x, which is a type A, and x is with list A. So. So x would be like the would be like an element from that from x's because we're we're given x's is like a list of a's and x is an a but like we said here we don't actually care what the element is because we we just want to calculate the length so I think we can just ignore this element. 
and then we just say int to int. Um, I think we just want to add one, right? So, so a list nil should be length zero. So if we just say like, um, isn't it, Kuminator said, isn't it easier to use a function with two args? Yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a second. So I'm just kind of like following this, um, Type holes. Um, so this plus one, like if I say type, what is the type of plus one? Um, it's a to a, where a is some number. Um, but it actually doesn't know that one is a uh, integer there. So I can, yeah, um, that's kind of wonky. But basically, this plus one is a function from int to int. Um, so this should work. So let me just reload this. Okay, no explosions. It's a good sign. So let's see what what is the length of a nil list. A zero, and length of um, one. Two nil should be two, right? Yeah. Okay. The way to think about this is we have this list one two nil. I'm going to get to your question, uh, Pluminator. So we have this list one two nil. Um, we started with uh, this thing. a little note here how to build an intuition hold right yes this is vs code the, the left left hand side is vs code in the i term um so fold right, basically, we give it a function that replaces this cons operator, and we give it a value that replaces nil. So we want to replace nil with zero, because if it's a nil list, we want the length to be zero. But if it's not a nil list, we want to replace cons with this function. <laughs> this function looks really weird. It's basically like ignore the argument and return a function <laughs> that takes an integer and adds one to it. That's that's basically what we're saying. <laughs> it's pretty bizarre. So it, so basically so if we fold right on this, we're basically saying take in zero. So let's let's evaluate this right side. So uh Take in zero, ignore it, turn a function that adds one to its argument. And then we apply that to two. Think of that the right way. Maybe maybe I should just follow this um this H lint suggestion. The H lint suggestion is saying you should edit reduce. So replace with length equals fold right. But because x is, is on both sides of this expression, we can remove it. Um, I, I said that earlier, but I don't know if everyone was here. So basically, just like in algebra, you could say x plus z equals y plus z. You could subtract z from both sides and get x equals y. That's kind of what um, we're doing here with uh, this function, which is so mind-blowing. Like, why Haskell is such a different paradigm 
than other languages because the equal sign is like is like really substitutional equality. It's not like assignment like in other languages. Um, so we can basically subtract list. For, so so in other words, this is saying length of x's is an integer that's equal to this integer. But when we remove x's, it's like saying length is a function that's equal to this function. Um, pretty pretty cool. Um, Luminator says, good call running HLint all the time. Yeah, I uh, have this extension in VS Code. Um, this one, it's just called Haskell. Uh, obviously, is very helpful. It also has this one uh, as a dependency, the Haskell syntax styling. And this Haskell linter um, is really helpful. Uh, I, th I think it's so helpful because as a Haskell noob, like it suggests things that I wouldn't have known to do all the time. So, uh, so like this has red squiggly. So let's hover over it. It's saying um, use const. So I found this lambda expression that's like ignores its argument and returns something. Why not just use const? Um, so that's like the same thing. So it's saying E const is the same as this. He is like the prelude module, um, I believe. Yeah, import qualified prelude sp. So, um, in Haskell prelude, there's this function that we can say type type of p dot const. No module name p is imported. const is a function that takes an a and a b and returns an a so it basically just re it ignores b so like const one two just returns one two r return foo um so it's just saying like in this case um we just always want to return plus one. We don't really care about the value. We don't care about what the element of the list is. We just want to add one to our accumulator. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I this illustration here is that helpful. Let me try to think of a different way to do it. The pluminator says another one is Stan, although it has different goals. Probably a good addition. Is it a VS code thing? And VS code. There says the test well the code. Basically, it says uh, map const one x sum, <laughs> yeah. Basically, change change the entire list. Map const one x is like saying uh, change the entire list into ones and then sum them. <laughs> so if we just took one two nil and change that into one one nil and then use this sum function that we defined up here which adds all the elements of a list together um, but it's pretty cool that they can have these prop tests um, i think i'm supposed to be able to click this and it like should run the test but that doesn't work for me i don't know like it just doesn't do anything um I don't know if, why that doesn't work. Maybe I don't have, maybe I need to install like Haddock or something. Maybe someone out there can tell me. Um, anyways, so that's 
that's uh that's our length function. I, I don't really want to use this p.const. I think I'm just going to stick with this lambda that uh, that ignores its argument. Um, even though hlint is going to yell at me. Um, I don't want to use p.const because the whole point of this course is like linear progression. We're rebuilding everything from scratch. So um, we do it this way. But let's test it. Say length. This is three. Length of nil is zero. Test. Test. Pass. Illuminator says, not sure about VS Code, but from GHCI, I think it's test doc test. Test a thing. Test doc test. Yeah, not sure. I don't want to, there's so many things I could Google right now. I just don't want to get too distracted. Let's move on to the next um, exercise. Cool, so we have map. We're going to implement our own map function. Pardon the language, I just think that's really badass. Like, never like done a Ruby or a JavaScript course. It's like, make your own map function. Maybe I'm just not doing the right courses. Um, map the given function on each element of the list. Okay, so the arguments to map should be a function. I'm going to call it f, and a list. I'm going to call x's so that they're in scope. And I'm just going to go with my regular mo and just put a type hole in there. Fresh. How about how about um how about we mob program this one? Anyone want to help me? To do is list b. We need to return a list B here. We have X's in scope, we have F in scope. So I mean, really, we still don't really have that much at our disposal, right? I mean we've we've implemented head or product some length. But basically the two tools we have are like fold right and fold left. <laughs> um Looks like doc tests are broken forever. Oh, no. uh, GitHub issue. Unfixable closed PR. Oh, that's sad. Maybe, maybe as I like go through this course, I could get. Uh, good enough at Haskell to like open a PR to the actual course, like try to help fix things. I mean, if he if Tony Morris says it's unfixable, though, it's like, uh, yeah. Anyways, okay. I know I said earlier, if you want to like go from array to array, use map um, filter. Array to a smaller array, use filter. And array to some value, use reduce. I mean, that's the way I think about it when I'm doing like JavaScript or Ruby. Um, but we could also just think of reduce or fold right as like array to some value. We didn't say this value couldn't also be an array, it just could be some other array. So we can still use fold right here. So we can say, Fold right ons and nil and x's. Anyone want to um, suggest anything? Cons should be a function from A, takes an A and a list B and returns. Yeah, reduce can also grow. That's true. Or change other type. Um, 
So cons should take an A and a list and return a list. Before it's been, it should take like two integers and return an integer. The nil should be a list. So the intuition, like, I like this intuition because it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, just go ahead and do this edit reduce so that hlint will stop bothering me. Um, just gonna remove the x's from each side of the expression. hlint, yeah, going away. Um, nil is nil, that's correct. So Illuminator says this can just be replaced this needs to be a list B. Well, a valid list B is the empty list. So the other way to th I'm thinking about this is I, I like this intuition of old right, like replace cons and replace a nil. So it's like if we map over an empty list, it should be empty list. Pretty intuitive. Um, so nil, yeah, that's just value to nil. I'm not even going to write that out. But if we have one. What do we want to replace? Um, so we are going to replace nil with nil. That's going to basically stay the same. What should this constructor be replaced with? Basically, we need. Um, Yeah, what is the other way to like do some like this? I guess. So let's just follow the type errors. That's when in doubt, right? So cons should be a function that takes an A. Ah, uh, didn't didn't read it then or loaded too fast. So we have our X now, which is of type A. And now to do so our cons function is now a function that takes an x and needs to return or needs to return a function of list b to list b. So we need we need a like oh so we have a we have an x that's an a and we have an f that takes an a to a b. So well, maybe I maybe I should uh, defer that even farther. So I could just say like, we take some beats, <laughs> go even farther down the hole. So this to this to do thing, unwrap this a little bit. The to do has this type signature. Let's be to let's be. So I can just say okay, let's take some beats and. But it says now. So now to do is literally just a list B. And we have B's scope. We could just return B's here. Of course that wouldn't that would compile, but it wouldn't be right. Actually it would probably work for the null case. <laughs> but um how else can we construct beats? You can tell me. Euler. Class. We need it. We need to return a list of B's. We have in scope an X of type A and F, which is a function that takes an A and returns it. Any suggestions? Just 
no suggestions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, since there's no suggestions yet, I'm gonna like replace to do with bees. So we have in scope bees, um, which is list B, and we need a list B. So this this should compile. Reload. Lots of warnings. Okay, so that compiled. Let's try it out. So map plus ten. Map plus ten over the this list. I would expect this to be eleven, twelve, thirteen. But it's just an empty list. What if we what if we map plus ten over nil? Empty list. So that actually is correct. <laughs> if you map over an empty list, it should be an empty list. So basically what's happening here is like The function that we've replaced cons with just ignores its argument and returns. Um, so it's it's basically like if if we change this infix notation to refix, we're saying f um, it's like f applied to two and nil and then f applied so it's basically this is what we're doing we're saying call f on two and nil and then call f on one and the result of f on two and nil so this function takes an x ignores it takes b's and just returns them so this function is going to say Take a two, which is this x, ignore it, and then take a nil, take some list, which in this case is nil, and return that list. So it just returns the nil list. So, so the result of this this expression is just nil. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and then. The result of this. So then we just do the same thing. This was res this results to nil. So now we take one, ignore it. We take some list, nil, and return it. So, um, yeah, this is not what we want. So we need to do something else here. Let me put back in the. Wait for the VS Code to load. Okay, to do should be a list B. So we have an X, which is an A of type A, which is basically this this first argument. So we're gonna get this this argument here, which you think of as being two. And good night, Pato. Thanks for thanks for joining the stream. Appreciate it. Um so have x and we have f so let's just f takes an a x is an a so let's just apply it so um i'm gonna i'm gonna do this syntax so i'm gonna say let y equal f applied to x in this expression so this is basically just making just a way of like doing some assignment um just so that I have this Y thing available in my to do. Reload. So, okay, so I still need to return a list B, but now I have this Y thing, which is a B. So, I can make b into a list b by appending it nil. That's basically the only thing I can think of. Turn b into a list. So let's try it. Variable not in scope. Oh, sorry. It should be y. 
y is of type b. So y is this fx thing. Oh, but you know what? I didn't use this beats. So instead of appending to nil, you should probably use this list b of, which the first time will be nil because that's the place you come up with. Okay, that compiles. Bam. Up ten over the list. Here we go. Awesome. So let's let's unpack this a little bit. So we don't need this temporary assignment to Y, so we can just place Y F of X. And then I'm just gonna like follow H lint, do what it tells me to do. Collapse lambdas replace. Let's see. All right, I think it's just saying I don't need the parentheses. That work? Okay. Okay, yeah, so it's saying, like, why not just take two arguments instead of a lambda? This. Done in bracket. Okay, so I don't need to wrap these effects in brackets. Okay, no more no more H lint. See if that still works. Okay, I see it'll work. So now that it's a little bit more simple, let me think through it again. Um so we're replacing cons with a function that takes a value in a list, applies the given function to the value and appends that to the list. So, so if if the function we're given is plus ten, uh, if the function we're given is plus ten, then Uh, we want to take some value x and some list b, which in this particular case is 2 and 0. We apply the function to the x, so this will become n plus 2, so that will be 12, and then we append that to nil. And then we do this again, so we apply uh, 10 to 1, get 11, and we append that to the list. I think, I think that's basically how I'm reasoning about it. Yeah, so I think, I think that's the, how, how to think about it. So maybe instead of F here, I'll or help to say like I mean this is kind of a weird way to read it.
Luminaries is you can make the cons point free. Just make it clear in my opinion. So explain that to me. So make cons point free. So then so then we remove this. Oh yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Actually, I've been using this uh site. I haven't talked about point three in the stream yet. Yeah, yeah. That is easier to understand. I think. So we we compose cons with F. But then we just say um yeah a little cheating yeah i am cheating by doing this but it's helpful when you're like starting out <laughs> so uh basically replacing cons with cons f maybe not easier to read at first about this. Puminaire says, thanks for showing that though. I'd love to figure out how that works. Um, like how this thing works, like how it works under the hood. Yeah. I think I've, I've poked around in the, um, the repo. I think it's on GitHub. This app is made possible by awesome point free binary extracted from Lambda bot. Ah, I guess it's coming from package. I guess I should explain point. <laughs> But it's getting late. Too tired. I think I'm probably just going to stop here at this map function. It's like a good stopping point. Do this map test, though. Map test. Yeah, so basically we're saying um, Is this the right way to like think about it? So it's it's infix though. That's that's what's confusing. So it's so it's saying like uh, the result of this. Just a lot of parentheses. Lisp. So maybe maybe the better way to think of it is like G equals this thing. And G applied to one result of G applied to that. So so two and nail get passed to this function. 2, which adds 10 to it, and then composes that with cons, which then cons is nil. It's like plus 10 and then append it to the second argument, which is nil. Then this becomes 12, and then it's plus 10, and this argument. Yeah. About that way. Here. I think of it as applying F and then consing the results. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, cons after F. I think what's weird to think about is that um, for beginners, it's this 
this thing is an argument. Th this is this expression is a function that takes two arguments. It takes an integer, or it takes an a and a list. I think. I believe it does. I think I can I can check by just going back to. Ah, this code's so slow that it's good in time. Yeah, cons takes an A and a list B, returns a list B. This takes an A and a list B. So A would be like the element of the list and the, like this list that's been accumulated. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for joining. Um, thanks for chatting, Pluminator. Appreciate it. Um, this is pretty fun. This is literally my first time streaming ever. Um, probably for the first like hour and a half, it was me and uh, a former coworker who I think was just being kind, <laughs> like lurking on the stream. Um, but then, like halfway through, uh, got some people. Um, on that seemed seem interested, fellow learners of Haskell. So um, that was fun. I might try to like edit this, put it on YouTube. I don't know. Maybe 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 if I'll rewatch it, it's just gonna be garbage. <laughs> but I had fun doing it anyways. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'll probably do this again. Some some weeknight this week. Um, anyone wants to follow along? Appreciate it. I I think it'd also be really cool to do like a pair programming. Um, I don't know if I'd want to do that with like. I don't know if it's safe to just do that with random str like strangers on Twitch. <laughs> but uh. Yeah, if you if you're interested in pairing, like I mean, we, let me know. Reach out to me somehow. Um, my Twitter is just like at louderdev. Um, but VS Code has this like pretty awesome. Whoa, there's a lot of formatting. VS Code has this like live share extension. You can like both be in the same code base. But like using your own editor, your own settings, or we could just do like screen share or something. Um, that'd be cool. Maybe I'll maybe I'll convince one of my friends to do that with me. But anyways, uh, thanks everybody for for joining. Appreciate it. I will catch you next time.